55 BC, Julius Caesar is leading eight Roman legions, a total of 40,000 men north through Gaul, a Roman province encompassing modern France, Belgium, and Switzerland. He wants to go to Germania, to Germany, and cross the Rhine because no Roman commander has yet done so. He wants to be as great a conqueror as Alexander the Great and go beyond what is known. The Rhine River lies on the edge of what is known. For centuries, it has been a buffer protecting Germanic tribes from Roman expansion. No previous army could cross it with the might needed for conquest. But Caesar is unlike any previous warrior. He could have gone by boat, but what is that for Julius Caesar to go by boat, man? Rowboat? You know, you're gonna put eight legions in a rowboat and row across? No, man, they gotta march across. They're gonna be on horseback. Crossing the Rhine was a completely new engineering feat as far as its scope. The uh, river's 1,000 feet across, possibly more, 25 to 30 feet deep, with unknown currents. Caesar and his engineers had to come up with a plan for a bridge that would be not only immensely strong, but immensely stable, and be large enough to be able to march a legion across. The bridge would need to be four football fields long and sustain the weight of 40,000 soldiers Despite the Rhine's width, depth, and strong currents, Julius Caesar is determined to succeed. To cross a river that size with a bridge is something which plays well with an audience back at home, but of course it's something that plays extremely well with the audience standing on the other side of the river, who are gonna be awestruck when they see this happening. With the speed and efficiency of a well-oiled machine, Caesar's soldiers methodically transform local timber into an expanding bridge. With every hour, an engineering miracle inches closer to the Rhine's elusive northern bank. It's almost as if a spaceship were to come down nowadays, the, the size, let's say, of half of Manhattan, capable of, of, of with some magnetic device that'll like lifting buildings up into the air. That would be a pretty frightening thing, something that we couldn't really grasp at all. The foundation of the bridge was a series of wooden piles driven into the bedrock of the river. Each pile was a foot and a half thick. Toward the middle of the bridge, they had to be up to 30 feet tall to reach from the surface to the bottom. By driving the piles in diagonally, Caesar's engineers added extra stability to the bridge. When they drove the pilings in at an angle and then connected them, in many ways they were doing what uh, carpenters do when they build a sawhorse. But with the legs angled, it utilizes forces to keep it from being pushed over and makes it a stable workspace. The sloping pile gives them a lot more strength against the force of the river and flooding of the river and so on. But it's much more difficult to drive them into the riverbed uh, than it is to drive a vertical pile. So they would have had to work very carefully with wooden frames to push them into the riverbed. On the upstream side, the piles leaned in the direction of the current. 40 feet downstream, the corresponding piles leaned against the current. Each set of piles was joined by a long connecting beam two feet thick. Lengths of timber were then laid across the beams and the surface was finished with tightly wrapped bundles of sticks. The design of the bridge itself was innovative, but what made this engineering feat even more astounding is the speed with which it was built. Just 10 days after ordering its construction, Caesar marched across his bridge and toward his destiny. Uh, if we tried to do that today, we would never be able to build something like that in so few days with that kind of technology. We could match that feat today if we had thousands of loyal, sweating soldiers totally dedicated to Caesar and the objective of getting across that Rhine River to terrorize the Germans beyond. Caesar had estimated the size of the Germanic forces at 430,000 
more than 10 times the size of his own army. But when the Germans saw the Roman legions rolling over the Rhine, they quickly fled to higher ground. For the next 18 days, Caesar freely explored the territory north of the Rhine, encountering no resistance. Then he crossed back over his bridge and dismantled it, having made an unmistakable point. It is symbolic of this. Rome can go anywhere. There's nothing going to hold Rome back. And to distill it even farther, Julius Caesar can go anywhere. Caesar's bridge was an early indication of his single-minded ambition. A decade later, that ambition would propel him to unprecedented power, but it would also prove to be his downfall. When he was declared Rome's first dictator for life at the age of 55 in 44 BC, whispers of assassination began to echo through the halls of the Roman Senate. He makes certain moves that suggest that he might want to have been worshipped as a god, that his ambition really goes so far beyond the limits of what the Romans themselves, and in particular Roman senators, felt to be acceptable, that he was assassinated. In life, Julius Caesar forever altered Rome's political landscape. In death, he would embody both the potential and the peril of absolute power. When Caesar was assassinated, there was no guarantee that anything would happen except that Rome would fall apart completely. Caesar's reign was a major turning point in Rome's political history. His conquest of Gaul greatly expanded the reach of Roman influence. His consolidation of power marked the death of the Roman Republic, ruled by democratically elected senators and consuls and the birth of an empire in which tyrannical emperors could rule with absolute authority. Some would use their power to build magnificent engineering marvels. The vanity, excess, and ignorance of others would push the empire to the brink of destruction. Through it all, Rome would grow into the most powerful and technologically advanced civilization the world had ever seen.